Hey guys, this is John Bokenkamp. I am one of the writers of our 100th episode, Abraham Stern, and you are listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. See a penny, pick it up, all day long? Well, I guess you need four of them to have good luck. Welcome to the special 100th episode celebration of the award-winning Blacklist Exposed podcast. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. I am Agent Aaron Peterson, and I'm never going to look at a heart tub time machine again. Ever. Think about it. Think about it. All right. <laughs> Thanks for joining us once again as we discuss number 100 on the Blacklist, Abraham Stern, written by the big cojones, John Eisendrath and John Bokenkamp or two Johns, as I like to call them, in collaboration with the Dave Metzger. The 100th episode was directed by Andrew frickin' McCarthy. That's now his middle name. Welcome, Pretty in Pink, Andrew McCarthy. Or Mannequin, or whatever, you know, there's so many movies I love him in. Less than zero. We could have Bernie's one and two? I mean one. <laughs> I don't know about two, but I'll give you one. I love the first one. The second one, I can't, he should have been a lot more decomposed. It really didn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that they tried it. What are you going to do? Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. <gasps> we Are you excited? I'll be honest with you. I'm The one thing I'll say about this episode, a lot of times they'll make it so it stands out. It's it's a little too standout-ish, if that makes sense, where you get the 100th episode and if you try to watch it in another sequence or later on in syndication or on your DVDs, it's really like, it's almost like an, it stands out too much. You know, some, some shows do that where they just make too big a deal about it. Yeah. They try to do like a crossover event or match up with some other show yes. or some, yeah. some big name guest star that really just doesn't fit the, the, this seemed like it fit perfectly into the the crux of everything. I, I think they did a really, a really good job because this functions, if you didn't tell me it was a 100th episode, I wouldn't know. But if you tell me and you see all the stuff they're doing, I can also see it working because there's callbacks to everybody's favorite blacklister, you know, and it just, it just worked all the way around. I really liked how you saw you have one character who came almost full circle. She was tracking the most notorious blacklister. Now she is the most notorious blacklister. So a lot of cool stuff. I really had a lot of fun with it. It was, and it, it was such a, Troy told me I was going to love it because he saw it before I did. And I'm like, well, what, why do you think I'm going to love it so much? He's like, you're going to love it because I love heist movies. I'm assuming is why you thought that. And as soon as it went to a heist mode, I'm like, what? Favorite show. Love it. It's over. <laughs> Best one. Number one for Aaron. Not number one. I, I'll be honest. Ruin and Cape May are kind of like right up there. Yeah, definitely. But, but I like the standalone stuff too. So, but the, the, having a heist, heist always worked for me. I love a heist. Well, I think the other fun part about this entire 100th episode is that we got to be there seeing some of these scenes actually getting filmed. And so seeing that translate onto the screen, I thought was really fun as we watched this episode too. Uh, that opening sequence with uh, Dembe and Red just kind of old chums chatting along, driving in the car. And we saw what that actually looks like, and it looks nothing like what it looks like on TV. It looks nearly ridiculous, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> but also amazing, kind of. I mean, I think anybody who is really a film or a TV aficionado, you've probably seen all the extra stuff, so you know how it's done, green screen, all that. But seeing it is different than – seeing it live is different than seeing it on, on TV because, I mean, it even looks less ridiculous on TV when you see it in person. You're like, oh, they're really just sitting there. Huh. That's acting. It's actually a lot more impressive to, to know what actors do when you see them actually interacting with things and, and reacting to stab wounds and things like that. It's, it's just crazy to see it in person. Well, not even the actors too, but even the cameramen and the angles and shots that they have to get – in order to make it look like that car actually tipped over when the truck hit it. I mean, I didn't see a truck hitting the car when we were sitting there on the on the set. So I think that's just a real testament to how both the cameraman and the actors have to work together and be in sync. And all of the choreographing that has to go into that is just really super interesting and exciting to watch. And all the crew. I mean, not to, I'm not going to throw like I'm not gonna name drop or anything like, but to see the crew interacting and on set and ready to go for whatever makeup effects or clothing effect, whatever, whatever needs to be done and the work that they have to do, because for every five seconds, it's probably an hour's worth of work for everybody. And it's really, it's really amazing to see it in person and to see what the people behind the scenes do and how much work they put into it and how much they really care to get it right. 
they really, you know, it's very important to them, not just for continuity, but as a professional pride. So it was, it was really fantastic to see that. I don't want to keep saying fantastic, but I will. I can. It was, it was, it was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, thanks again to Sony for inviting us out and Megan and Amir for the great hospitality while we were there. It was just, it was a really fun time just to be able to be there. And then all of the cool stuff that we were able to do while we were there to bring that all to you tonight on this podcast episode, all the great interviews and discussions that are, you're going to hear. It's just all thanks to that tr- wonderful trip. It was a, a fun time to hang out with you and too, and, and do it together. That was just a blast. Poor choice of words, but that's cool. Uh, <laughs> one thing I will say out of all the stuff that we did, and I could just sit here and name it like talking to Spade or stuff you're going to hear, talking to Megan, uh, talking to Amir. Obviously, we met him before, but he's great. And Megan's been great before. And Spader was just the nicest guy in the world. But my favorite thing, Troy, was we went to Central Park and rode bicycles around the park like a happy couple. And it was probably the coolest experience <laughs> Next to obviously a blacklist, but in fact, in being in New York, it was the coolest experience I had in New York at, to that point. Minus those seven blocks on Park Avenue <laughs> where we almost died twice. Yeah, that was, that was a little hectic. But just riding bikes around the entirety of Central Park was a lot cooler than I even imagined. It was it's it's a pretty surreal experience. It was a fun trip. Fun trip. Yeah. So here's what you guys get to look forward to. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about it when we get there, but you are going to hear, like Troy said, interviews from the major actors from the show on this very podcast. We're going to talk about the show like we always do, where we kind of discuss the overall plot of the episode and then go into where each character's arcs were. But this episode is going to be a lot different and we'll explain that a little bit more when we get there. But you will hear interviews from James Spader, Megan Boone, Diego, Captain Gnome, that's what I like to call him, and everybody else. So please be prepared. You're going to have a, a great time. It's a great episode. Let's take it away. And you said Captain Gnome. That's almost a spoiler alert. But we'll get to that after we <laughs> talk to all of you about what you guys thought about a profiling question last week. What is Cooper's confession inside that secret envelope? Larissa Waynes said, I believe it was a confession that he knew Red from before he turned himself in. Or a confession that the DNA results are not correct, and then he knew that all along, that our Red is not the real Raymond Reddington. Or both. Makes sense. It would be both. Wow. Mm. That would be insane. My mind is kind of blown right now. <laughs> um, Robin, Yours? Yeah. I didn't know I didn't know robots could have an exploding brain. Uh, shut down. Malfunction. <laughs> uh, Robin, Does not compute. Does not compute. End of line. Robin Day Durham, <laughs> when red-handed Harry, the USB concerning the Middle Eastern country, Kuwait, uh, they were in together. He gave Harry the only copy. It was in season two, and I think it had some not so nice information about Cooper. Marcelli Sierra. I think it's just an accumulation of a lot of things he's let slide by since leading the task force. It's been a few things. It's been a few. Grace Norman said maybe it's when he broke down doors and was willing to hurt people this season, or it might be everything he's ever done that's illegal. Everything. At JS underscore 1974, he removed the fingerprints from Red out of every system, like Ephes, so no evidence could point to Raymond Reddington. This action made him also not connected to the death of Diana Fowler. Huh. Ah, I like that idea. At Peoria 509 said it was from a long time ago when Cooper was better and found out that he was not sick, dying, and how Red actually took care of the doctor. Hmm. So what's what's your theory of what what uh, Cooper's confession is? Well, the biggest thing that comes to my mind besides Kuwait and maybe some of the things that Cooper and Red have done in the past, but specifically in the task force, I think that it was his involvement with letting Liz actually escape from the Tom Connolly shooting. Okay, I could see that. That makes sense. Get it off his chest. Yeah, I mean, he literally said, "Run, Liz, run!" <laughs> Instead of "You're under arrest." I totally understand. You want to hear my theory? Sure, go ahead. I think his confession, okay, everybody now, write it down, because if it comes true, I want everybody to send me a dollar. His confession is he once robbed a plane mid-flight and then escaped via parachute. There you go. That's my guess. Anything is possible. You never know. And then he changed his name to Harold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. Psh, it. Next. All right, for our profiling question next week, I only have one. I just want to know what you all think of Red's new hat. 
<laughs> that's your quest. All right, I'll allow it. Not, not what's the new, new age technology? What's that gizmo? What's the glass eye? He wants to know what do you think of the hat. I laughed out loud when Spader laughs in that scene. I just busted out laughing. It was so funny. <laughs> I, I just saw Darkest Hour, so that was that was a, a funny correlation. Because I'm watching that going, yeah, I don't I don't think Reddington's in the same vein as Churchill, but I like it. I like it. I'm a fan. Uh, I mean, yes, if you want to a- answer, like, where do you think the eye is going to lead them? No, no, no. We'll stick with too. the hat. What do you guys think of the hat? That's fine. Have a fun one. It's a 100th episode. Let's have fun. We're all drinking, aren't we? Absolutely. Cheers to everybody. But now, before Liz decides to go all Vanessa Cruz on us for her next incarnation of a blacklister, let's get to the 100th case profile. Okay, before we get to that show description, this is where we're going to break it down. What? That's my rap sound. For this episode of The Blacklist Exposed, we're going to do things a little different. You see, they had a 100th episode... We are going to discuss that episode, like I said, that aired. And as usual, we kind of discuss what happens to a specific character throughout. So we talk about every character and what their arc is throughout the episode. But here's where it gets even better. Because after we discuss that character's arc for Abraham Stern, immediately following, we will also be playing our interviews with those specific actors playing those roles. That's right. You get a two for one in this episode. You get the normal Blacklist Exposed plus bonus stuff. And there are some really fantastic discussions within these interviews. You will hear, like I said, from Megan Boone and James Spader. Every interview, I think, is really interesting, and there are some great conversations. Absolutely. With that, tell us what this episode was about. The 100th episode is all about, if you think about it, a member of the British Treasury, William Lowndes, in the early 18th century, huh, coined the phrase, You can't laugh before you say it. <laughs> That's not, sure how jokes work. Sure <laughs> That's not how jokes work. That's not how jokes work. We coined the phrase, take care of the penny and the pounds will take care of themselves. Well, that's exactly what Mr. Stern, a former employee of the Denver Mint, intended when he decided to leave four special bronze Lincoln pennies to his son Abraham, tonight's blacklister. On them specifically, a treasure map to a huge sum of money. Federal Reserve notes payable on demand worth billions of dollars. I think the, it's mil- I think it's hundreds of millions. Hundreds I don't of think millions. It was billions. Yeah. Well, in today's currency, right? Because they were they were actually you know drafted back when he was an employee at the Mint. So inflation and all of that. We're going to call it billions for the fun of it. So basically, because you wrote it wrong, we're adjusting the inflation value. <laughs> Is that what we're doing? That's exactly right. Okay. Red, I like this science. Red will be worth billions now because he was already mid nine fingers. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> The Mint says that these things never existed. The trouble is that Abraham actually spent the four pennies on four fireball candies and has now spent the rest of his life chasing this mythical treasure ever since. And it turns out that Red happens to have one of these pennies that he actually lifted from Grace and Blaze earlier this season. Now, when Abraham ambushes Red and steals the penny, the hunt for the treasure is on. Now, Red is determined to get back the penny, of course, and maybe a portion of the treasure if it exists. He partners up with Abraham to break into the Mint, only to be double-crossed by him. But thanks to Team Reddington and some good old-fashioned carny speak, Red pulls one over on Abraham, stealing back the penny along with the Federal Reserve notes. But as we all know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So Red decides to trade his one Lincoln penny, formerly worth $3 million and now basically worthless, to a dealer who is willing to trade the penny for a hat, once worn by one Winston Churchill. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that what it was? Was carny speak? Yeah, it was the Carney speak. Don't you remember they came up with their own language? That's how they, that's, yeah, they that's hired right. it from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Because I kept listening to it going, is, is that a reference that I don't remember? it? I can't remember what that I, – I thought I knew it, but I couldn't think of what it was. And yes. I don't remember that in The Greatest Showman. <laughs> Not at all. Well, they sung, so it was, it was easier to understand. Everything, <laughs> yeah. Everything's more yeah. fun when you tap your tail. That is true. Have you seen that movie? Go see it. It's Go amazing. Go see it. It's great. At the other side of the coin, Liz disposes of Navarro's body, Stewmaker style, hides evidence from the cops, steals evidence from the cops, all to find a glass eye that may lead her in red to Tom's killers once and for all. So speaking of all overall, I got to say, I was a bit surprised this was the 100th episode. I know that there are some listeners who were probably 
I don't want to say disappointed because I think everybody enjoyed the show from what I've seen, but I, I do think they were expecting some huge mythology elements. And I'm actually of the mindset that I'm glad there wasn't any. And I agree with you. I think that having a giant mythology option really would have taken away from the episode a little bit because when you go deep with the mythology, you only really focus on two of the characters, which would be obviously Red and Liz. And I think this was more in a way to showcase everybody as much as possible, but at the same time, really focus on the blacklister, which having Nathan Lane in this episode, I thought he knocked it out of the park. He always does. I mean, it's it's Nathan Lane. But specifically, I love the scenes that he and Spader had against each other when they're looking at the penny and trying to find the topographical Mm -hmm. map and putting the pennies together and like they're it just they look like two kids in a candy store. It was so much fun to watch on screen. And I hope that for the future that we get some more Nathan Lane type uh, actors to come in and play against these these this great cast that we have. I I found it really kind of refreshing because you you know we started the season off with Red lighter and then he kind of got back to being same old Red to to a large degree. And it was it was cool to see him okay he's gotten everything back that he wanted he's gotten his his wealth back now he's found his joy again with this with this treasure hunt it was nice to go back to the start of the season it felt like in in a lot of ways because i think we had gotten they'd gotten away from the more jovial spirit he had embraced when he was poor and he kind of just just came back around to it really really thought it was a fun episode was not at all what i expected nathan lane was an inspired choice and i'm really glad they they selected him because he he's a guy that hasn't been around in enough stuff lately, you know. I mean, I know he rose to fame with the Birdcage, but he's been in theater and and movies and television forever. He is a one of the most talented actors out there, especially character actors. So it was nice to see him pop up on the blacklist. That was really cool. Loved it, loved it. But you know what? Let's get into characters. We got four new tunes. They went all out on the music budget for this week. <laughs> Plus, we got an oldie but goodie coming back, which I thought was really fun. So first up, Ren and Dembe chat about adventure and mystery as we hear Trapa Lounge's Cool Mambo in the background on the radio. Later on, as Liz looks for a way to dispose of Navarro's body, we hear Kurt Vile's Life Like This. Then when Liz takes it upon herself to become the new version of the Stewmaker, we are treated once again to the Soons Up Past the Nursery, which you might remember from season one. Mm-hmm. And also, as the double crossing heats up between Team Red and Team Stern, we hear my type from St. Motel. And then we close up the episode, and Liz cleans out the bathtub of love as we hear Legendary by the group Welshly Arms. Lots of good tunes, lots of good tunes. And of course, you can always find those on the Blacklist Spotify playlist or the one that we have over on Apple Music. You can get those links at the case profile for this episode for Abraham Stern over at theblacklistexposed.com. I still say best music in, in television. I, I play the playlist all the time. I mean, it's got... I do. I think we're yeah. over like 150 songs now. I have ran so many miles to blacklist music. It's kind of sad. <laughs> that is like, kind of sad. Very, very sad because I often... Look, I, I give Trey a lot of grief because he is a blacklist obsessy like i watch a show i enjoy it i talk about it here and i and i do put the hours in on this podcast which does take a lot of work believe it or not <laughs> but he works way harder on it and i always give him a lot of grief about it like oh man not everything is blacklist related da, 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 you know there's life and then i'll be jogging listening to like five blacklist songs in a row and realizing you know maybe i should shut the hell up <laughs> it would maybe make my, it would make my life better i'm just saying Really? On a podcast? That'd be interesting. It would be interesting. I want to hear one. I want to listen to a whole episode. You know what? I'm going to skip next week. Just you <laughs> can handle it. I want to listen to that episode. Uh, it would be fun. It would be fun. It'd probably be great. It'd probably, <laughs> probably be the best one. You can just do this on your own, man. I don't need to be here. Let's get into the other characters. Uh, starting with Nathan Lane as Abraham Stern. It was a really, really sad, sad story about his dad. Living in the shadow of a crime, nobody could prove he committed it. I like that wording. And then he died penniless. That was cute. Felt like a, a Troy joke. I, I actually said it, and I'm like, oh, that's a Troy joke. <laughs> the delivered pause gave it away. Yeah, exactly. The, the What we come to find out is that etched into the pennies were actually a map. And I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was a very, very smart play because I kept trying to figure out. I, you know, I figure you put them together. Maybe they unlock something. Maybe it takes four pennies. And the way that he had made them, you know, once you put them in the slot, you know, a certain – 
in a certain order, it would unlock something. I thought that was a very clever thing that they did. And I, I like that aspect of it. And you were saying, Troy, that it reminded you of National Treasure in a way. Totally agree. Yeah. The, the best part about it was the fact that it actually says E pluribus unum on the, on the thing. And it said, out of many, meaning out of many pennies, there's one answer. I thought that was kind of cool how they tied in the actual E pluribus unum on the penny as well into the course of the story. Really, really right. good, good writing all around for this one. One thing, this moron sold them for candy, for fireballs. He sold these pennies for. Have you had a fireball? Those things are awesome. Is it the sour? Is it the hot ones? The hot ones, yeah. Yeah, I don't like. I don't like hot. I like. I like tepid. <laughs> that's that's what I'm into. That's why we live in Chicago. Yeah, exactly. So one question, okay? Because this one, all right. There's only two things in this episode where I was like, "What?" But this is the big one. So they open this boiler door, and tons of cash falls out. Like nobody's ever checked this. The bricklayers are are surrounding the area. Nobody opens that door just to see. I, I've never seen a handle I could I shouldn't pull that I didn't pull. So I, I just can't fathom that not happening. Well, I guess it depends on how the blueprints and stuff were laid out and how they started building around this old boiler room because it technically had fallen off of the map of all the schematics and stuff. So unless you're digging through as a historian to find this lost secret room that exists, maybe they just didn't bother. You know, it was there and they somebody laid those bricks around that boiler room. And they never thought, you know what, let's just see what's in the boiler. I'm curious. Maybe there's a body. Maybe Freddy Krueger's in there. I don't know. Let's check it out. Nobody? It's a government job, man. This has to be answered. It's very important. This is more important than, is Rad Liz is a dad? This needs to be answered, as far as I'm concerned. And why hide it in the furnace? What happens if somebody lit that thing? That's the other question I had. That's a good question. Mine's better. Why didn't anybody open the door? Because they wouldn't light it on fire because there's hundreds of millions of dollars in there. Or billions, as it were. Time to move on. You know what? Let's get into some excitement. John Eisendrath and John Bokenkamp. Now, you've heard John Bokenkamp on our show. You have not heard John Eisendrath. These are the two guys that make this show and episode happen along with Dave Metzger. They're the wizards behind the curtain. They are the showrunners. And we had a few questions for them on this 100th episode as well. First one. We caught up with Powers B and we asked them exactly what was special about this milestone. Well, I would say that um, there are a few reasons why this is the most special. One, in this day and age, getting to 100 episodes is much different, different. than in the old days. I mean, we were doing 35 episodes a year on 90210, so it was a lot easier to get to 100. Uh, and let alone the other issues with the television landscape. And, you know, I just think that this one had... Um, just something just from the very beginning that was uh, both good, just a lot of good shows fail, but this was really good and having a bad guy at the center of a show that you're writing is just a joy I mean he is, as John was saying earlier wish fulfillment for the viewers, wish fulfillment for the writers, so in that regard, and he's easily, you know one of the best actors in TV in this generation. So for all those reasons, a pleasure uh, in this show is singular. I assume you got a few hundred more to come. No, I don't know about that. It, it, uh, no, it's super, it's, it's, um, that's really special. It's, it's wild. It makes me, re- like, I, again, I, I was, it's like a weird family. Like, people have had babies and gotten married, and, you know, we come out to New York and see people that we, you know, you know, we work very closely with the writer's room and stuff, so it's, um, it's, it's special that it's uh, a big landmark, you know, so it, it's still just as hard to write as 98 and 32 and... 101, you know, so they don't get any, it's not any easier because of that, does but it it's get fun. More, does it get more difficult? I think it gets hard to not repeat stuff you've done. That's, I don't even think that's the thing that's I been I think the hard. stories are always increasingly difficult as time goes on. Writing the scripts is easier. You're more familiar with the characters. It's easy to write. But the stories, which are always the hardest thing, get harder. But like you said before, the firsts are the thing, and it's yeah. hard to have, it's hard to have firsts, you know, 100 episodes in. And now... Being the writers, we wanted to know from the Johns which blacklister actor brought more to the part than what was actually on the page. Plus, which actor would they most like to see as a blacklister? Well, only because I was thinking about this episode earlier when someone was asking me a question. The guy, and I can't remember his name, who played this character, Onslow Garrick. Mm-hmm. Richie Costa. Rich, yeah, Richie Costa. He was great in a way that um, he had a sort of 
wandering weirdness to him. I remember he put his head on the uh, glass of the orange box, and I was like, what exactly is he doing? And it was great. And so he was, in, in my recollecting, just first draft recollection of it, he was an example of someone who was just so much better and different than I, I had imagined. I think Tom Noonan was as yeah. weird as he is. He was even weirder than I had expected. You know, he just had a, yeah, he was, you know, I remember him, there was, uh, there's a moment in the stew maker where, you know, he takes out his teeth and takes off his hair, but then he pauses at the mirror and he's naked and he kind of stretches and he does this little stretch that I was like, wow. And he shaved his armpits and done this whole thing. He was, uh, even weirder than I had anticipated. Is there anybody you guys wish you could get on the show that you haven't yet? We always Nathan have Lane. talked about... Well, Nathan Lane's amazing. For some reason, and we've given up, because years ago we were always like, Christopher Walken would be amazing. And uh, then we talked to his managers or his agents. He's like, you know, he doesn't want to play a bad guy anymore. It's like, he doesn't want to play a bad guy. He's Christopher Walken. So he um, <clears throat> is an example of someone who I think would have been or would be incredible. Have you reached out to Victor or Ron Rifkin and all? See if well, you know what? We have Victor Garber. Uh, both of them would be incredible. Uh, we, I don't know why we haven't. Because, yes, they'd be amazing. They'd be really great. I, gotta amazing. Make, I think it would be great to have... Uh, I've tried for years to get uh, Dwight Yoakam. Oh, yeah. I think he would be great. He would be good. Lyle Lovett would be awesome. And as John has heard too many times, June Squibb would be amazing. I'd love to have her on the show. So those are there's three of them. I'd go Jason Priestley, but you know that was. <laughs> he makes that would really be, good. That'd be interesting. Yeah, he's good. He could, he's, he's, he's yeah. doing some darker stuff. Be, like that. Yeah. Who would you want to see most as a blacklister, Troy? I'm curious. Uh, well, I mean, in the interview you heard there, I mean, Victor Garber is the first one that comes to mind. I would love to see Victor play a blacklister. I know, but that was on the spot, so I'm I'm kind of curious. Is there anybody you thought of like after the fact that came to your mind? After the fact, wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> I I still say Robert Downey Jr. with McCarthy directing would make my dream come true. Well, it would. I mean, that would be fun. I I do not disagree. Maybe um the man who played Mr. Pennywise the Clown, Bill Skarsgård, maybe he'd be a good blacklister. Oh, or you know another one. Maybe Kim Cattrall. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. With Andrew McCarthy directing. This is basically all my 80s favorites. I'm just going to make them blacklisters at this point. There you go. <laughs> and now, if Kurt Russell had an option, that would be my dream. Because, I mean, Spader's work with him. Kurt Russell's my favorite actor of all time. I think that would probably make me so happy. Kurt so Russell happy. is a blacklister. Can you imagine? He'd be great, though. Have you ever seen him? I mean, he... he you ever seen him in a Tarantino movie? He can handle it. He can be a bad guy. So you're basically just going and playing Six Degrees of Spader at this point. Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I'm basically picking all my favorite Spader movies and seeing who he was with in that movie, who could we bring into the black... All right, shut up, Troy. All right. All right so <laughs> Lastly, from the Johns, being the big music person that Boken Camp obviously is, we wanted to know what the one song that best describes the feelings he was having for this 100th episode celebration. Feelings? It would be feelings. Uh, uh, one song that would describe it. Um, I, I, uh, I got, I don't know. That, I mean, that's a weird one. It'd have to be like upbeat and sort of party time song. Probably something by The Cure, maybe. I don't cool. know. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not, not sure. Music, the... But the first song we had, 99 Problems. Now we're at 100. So you did the 99. And, there's the... Oh. and maybe able to use that. That would be kind of interesting. I saw to it. Use again. It I, yeah, I don't know there. if it will work or not. But 99 Problems is a good one, yeah. Can I just point out the Cure is not really an upbeat party band? I don't. No, but they've got some. They've got some uh, upbeat ones that are sort of weird and moody, but kind of upbeat. Depends Weirdly on the kind upbeat. of party you're at. Yeah, when exactly. You're That's true. All right, guys. Now we're moving on to Dembe Hisham Tafwik. He uh, basically in this episode he's Red's muscle, and he knows Red loves a treasure hunt. I, I don't know if Dembe really got to do a lot much more than that this episode. But he said a lot of words in this one compared to last week. He did. He hasn't really had a whole lot of dialogue lately. We, we kind of need a Dembe episode, don't we? Yeah, I want to go back to the uh, Cooking with Dembe show. That was fun. <laughs> cooking with Dembe. He needs to do a cookbook. That'd be great. We did get to talk to Hisham, and it's always been his dream to be an actor. So we wanted to know what was it like for him to go from a role that was supposed to be a one-time appearance to still be in there 100 episodes later. 
I don't know if it's really sank in yet, you know what I mean? Because, uh, you know, like a lot of people are saying, oh, 100 is like a huge accomplishment. But for me, because of the way I started, it, it, it wasn't like, this is what you're going to be doing. I never knew for the first two seasons if I was going to be used. Right. And it wasn't until the third season when I became series regular. And then, you know, so I'm still kind of uh, going through the feelings of actually what this is. Um, and I probably won't truly understand it until it's over and I'm looking for another job. But part of me, you know, you know, uh, I speak to a lot of my friends who are in the business and they're like, you know, that's a huge accomplishment. Um, so part of me recognizes it, but I think part of me is uh, it's still taking a while to seep into my bones. We also wanted to know which episode was Hisham's favorite of all time. I love uh, season one, episode nine with um, wow, Angelo you get Garrett. The yeah, Angelo the Garrett, real. man. I just, I love that that blacklist. Now, lastly, if Hisham could go back and play any other character, can you guess which one he would pick? Because you might be surprised. Cooper. <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, I like I like his role. I like yeah. I like Cooper's role. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I love it. especially not this past episode. I think two episodes ago where he was looking for the kid. Yeah, and he was out in the field and running and gunning. I, li- I like that Harry Cooper. So yeah, I would that was love if, if any other thing. I would I would love doing something like that. All right, I hope you guys are loving these, man. You got a lot more. You got a lot of cooler stuff coming. So well, I also, get ready. I also think it's great because we actually had a Sham on the show. Like way back in what was it, the end of season two? Or was that in I think so, three? yeah. No, it was season three. It was season three. Season so it was before three, Kate May. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was really great to be able to meet Hisham in person because we've actually talked to him previously and then to be able to actually put the face to the name and the the voice and stuff. So it was really fun. So really cool to spend some time with Hisham while we were there on set. Yeah, it was really cool. He's a really super nice guy. Now we're to Clark Middleton, Glenn. He endures a bit of pain just to enable the break in. My question for you is, I, I know he's getting paid because he made a point to that, but is he doing this job, this J-O-B for Red or for Liz? I'm kind of confused on that. Well, if he's doing it for Liz, he's technically doing it for Red. So I, I think at this point, he's just doing it to get out of the house away from mom. That's what he said, right? <laughs> well, the hospital is going to be a five-star resort. Yeah, absolutely. So I, 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 I think he's doing it for the money first and foremost, right? It's all about the cash. Okay. Well, he did get a card from Red, so my my indication is that it was probably for Red, but he called him a licentious cur. Cur, yeah. (laughs) What? (laughs) What? Who even finds that word? Uh, But Troy did actually. I actually didn't get to talk to to, uh, Clark, but Troy did. So tell us what you learned from Glenn. Yeah, I mean, this was a really fun interview for me because obviously Clark was also on Fringe. So we got to have some uh, good conversation about Fringe beforehand. But most importantly, we chatted with him and said, what is his number one favorite thing about The Blacklist? The writing is just spectacular. I uh, always say that from the very first minute I laid my eyes on the page, the very first episode I did of Blacklist, I felt like I knew... I could see into his bedroom slippers. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, he was a, uh, and and that's that's a testament of really great writing. It's just when you read something that pops off the page at you as an actor, you know that they've done the heavy lifting, and you can really run with it because uh, with what they write, it opens up so much more in your imagination. So. Um, that's the thing that I always look forward to in every episode I play. When I hear I'm going to do an episode, I can't wait to get my eyes on the script because I know I'm just going to get some juicy, fun, juicy stuff to do. And then obviously we all loved the campfire scene in front of the airplane this season. So just had to know from Clark specifically, like when he read that scene for the first time, what was the feelings that he had coming from that specific scene? Well, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, I love every episode, but it's it feels to me that every time I do a new episode, I like it better than the last. So, uh, I mean, I loved that scene because I felt like it uh, had evolved my relationship with uh, Red. Uh, Glenn's relationship with Red, it, uh, it evolved, you know, and it also was an opportunity for me to 
continue to, as I like to say, develop character, you know. And, um, yeah, and of course it never for a second lacked the humor that Glenn always has. Absolutely. Yeah. So humor's the best part of the character. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely, it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, he just thinks he, he should be doing everything James is doing. <laughs> you know, I mean, he thinks I'm as good as you are and I should be tripping around the world doing it. You really need me. So. Well, I think we need to get an episode with you wearing a fedora just to dick around with him a little bit more. Oh, that's a great idea. We should tell John Bokenkamp that. I should... I should, should wear a yeah, fedora. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, great idea. You know, as a matter of fact, I may even tell John that. Yeah, I will great. tell him that. That'd be awesome. Though. Oh, that's cool. It just, you know, I think it shows the character, especially with the relationship you guys have now from the airplane scene. It should be like, hey, we're bros, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that last moment when James uh, patted me on the back. I remember when we were shooting that, or I say red, Pat Glenn on the back, but uh, when we, I felt him pat me on the back in that first take, and I thought, oh, that's great. I hope, just hope he keeps repeating it. And, uh, and he did. And uh, that's one of those actor touches that uh, James brought to it that is, you know, again, a testament of his tremendous contribution as an actor to this this show you know it's because it comp- continues to evolve you see the evolution in that relationship between uh, red and glenn okay now wrestler now he had a lot of he had a lot of screen time last week but this week was pretty much dominated by red and liz so he doesn't get a whole lot but he does get there right when stern trips the alarm playing right into Stern's nefarious plans. Is there anything else about Wrestler I missed this week? Uh, well, he, got, he was supposed to get on a plane, apparently, and head all the way to Denver to see what the heck was going on. I, mean, I thought that was a fun line. It's like, we're in Washington, D.C. Okay, it's going to take uh, at least four hours to fly to Denver. <laughs> I think it'll be done by then. <laughs> they might be out of there. They might be gone. Uh, I thought that was a fun what? line. But yeah, he was supposed to basically check to see what, what Red was up to and, and take Navabi with him, so... All right, well, in case you didn't know, Diego Klattenhoff is Donald Russler on The Blacklist, and we caught up with Diego, and he even he got in on the wrestling wrestler bit. You come into the show at the beginning. You're like this tough brute, barking orders, mm-hmm. running around. You've mm-hmm. been chasing Reddington the whole life. Mm-hmm. How do you think the character has evolved Not at to all. this point? <laughs> Zero. 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 Uh, we've been talking about this for a while about the uh, you know the change between black and white into this endless varying shades of gray and trying to find uh, trying to wrestle with you know who I was and potentially who I am and we'll see where that ends up. We then asked Diego what his biggest takeaway was after 100 episodes. It's just work, uh, consistently working and doing, um, being part of compelling projects and. From day one, as soon as I read the, the pilot for this, I, I talked to my representation, talked to my manager, and said, you know, I, this is, I have to do this. You know, it was right uh, when I found out, uh, you know, things were winding down on Homeland, and that had been such a, an amazing show and a, a great run, and, and uh, I wanted to keep that going. And, you know, here we are almost five years later. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm very fortunate, but it just stems from trying to find... Good writing, good characters, compelling stories that people can can um, kind of get sucked down that rabbit hole watching. Best part about it is that Aaron and I actually got to watch a brand new movie that Diego was in called Radius, available on iTunes and on demand while we were on the plane uh, mm-hmm. flying to New York. And so when we got there, we wanted to ask Diego a very specific question because there's a certain scene in the movie that you guys might all chuckle about in the movie in Radius. When you bust into the door to break into the house, mm-hmm. did you use a garden gnome for that? I did. I actually found one, um, and they didn't know it was part of uh, the lore of the show. But we were in Winnipeg. It's pouring rain, lots of bugs, and um, we were shooting off in the country. And they said, "Okay, you got to break this window." And we were shooting at you know one of these locations at somebody. It's actually somebody's house, and. They're like, oh, there's this rock, and you know, we have a selection of rocks or a brick or whatever. And I was like, uh, there's a. I spied this garden gnome earlier in the day, and I was like, oh, I think that would be great. So nobody got it until after we'd done it, and it was too late. I didn't want to alert anybody so they could take it away from me. Right. Part of your job as an actor is, you know, 
hide these things until it's too late so nobody can take it away. Which I think is great because it shows that you're connected with the fans because everybody reacted, obviously, when you kicked the Garden Gnome. That here you're, you're putting like these Easter eggs in your other work, which of I thought course. was fantastic. I thought it was just a nice, a funny little wrinkle, nothing to take away from, from the movie or anything. Oh, no, but no. no, no, it's uh, something fun to do. Okay, now Cooper, he had some fun. Like, this entire episode, Cooper is having a ball. Everybody's having a ball in this episode. Cooper is really am- amused that Red got <laughs> robbed. I thought that was probably my favorite moment from Cooper so far this season. Just <laughs> laughing at Red. You were robbed? <laughs> <laughs> Just the irony is funny. Uh, they have a, a really nice conversation, and he does at the end, and he offers a penny for the truth. And this is where everybody collectively went, <gasps> Mythology! What did you think the question was going to be? I seriously thought it was going to be around the whole, like, why, why are you in this? What, what's the connection to Liz? What's all this for? And then he just goes back to the, why did you steal the rag? And I was like, that's what you want to know? <laughs> exactly what I thought. As soon as he said it, I'm like, okay, that's cool that the Red did. And I thought, you know, maybe that would work with the original question that Red answered that he wasn't even asking. But... I'm of the same token where he's saying, name your price. I asked the question that's been bugging me for five years. That's the question. I'm with you 100%. That would be the question I would ask. Not, hey, just steal evidence. Who cares? I don't care. Steal it. (laughs) I want to know, who are you really her daddy? What's up with this? What's going on? Tell me some stories. That's what that's what that penny's worth. Well, I mean, he knows that. I mean, he did the DNA test, so he knows about the, the parental or what he thinks he thinks he knows of the parental relationship. I'm more. I would be asking more of the question of why now? Why after all this time are you finally back in her life? Not exactly. Hey, who stole the cloth? <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about the cloth later. But first, Harry Lennox was nice enough to stop by. He was actually supposed to be at the C2E2 event that we had last April, but unfortunately couldn't make it because of the uh, filming commitments that he had. So that's how we were able to get Susan to show up, uh, Mr. Kaplan herself. So, But we chatted with Harry and just wanted to know, especially for him, he's a TV, a film, and a theater guy. What's the biggest difference for him between those? And what does this 100-episode milestone mean to him? I think there's increasingly little difference between big screen and small screen. As the technology develops, it gets less expensive. Um, so much for we can recreate much of Hollywood uh, movie magic uh, on television in ways that we weren't able to do, say, 30 years ago. When it was all that film and equipment and all that stuff. Now everybody's using the same media, the same uh, tape, the same kind of... It's just the production value generally, but there are big production movies and small production, uh, just like in television. So I think there's very, very little difference. Television is getting bigger, uh, the movie screens are getting smaller. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's, I think that we're really having a point of intersection between the two. Uh, 100 episodes into this is, is a great privilege. It's the longest job I've ever had uh, in terms of number of shows uh, outside of the theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had a longer engagement in theater somewhere? Yes, yeah, so I've probably done a couple hundred uh, performances of, for example, Malcolm X, when I played, or, and a couple of other characters in August Wilson that I've done hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. But uh, that said, this is uh, this is great. It's a, quite a, an achievement. I've never been on a show that's been this well received, uh, enduring, and so I'm proud of it. And also, since Red is the devil on one shoulder and Cooper is the angel on the other. Who cares more for Liz between the two characters? I think that uh, blood is thicker than water, certainly, and uh, not that I, not that Cooper has watery uh, feelings toward her. I think, he, but that's sort of more. Uh, but I think certainly red. Mm-hmm. I think that he is certainly much more complicated. Um, so I, 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 I would say, although I love her deeply, my friend, very much, I just concerned for her. Uh, but I, I wouldn't ever want to, you know, be a surrogate father for her while her father is alive. And finally, we asked him, what is the one takeaway, the one memory from this 100 episode run? Probably going back to the pilot, it's just, uh, you know, uh, wondering whether the show would be viable, wondering if people would tune in. But then seeing Spader, you know, in the box, uh, and that being part of the whole sort of tease of the show, that was part of the whole promo campaign, I, I, I knew then, or I had a gut feeling at that point, that, uh, that it would have likes, and, and we were right. 
Okay. Now we're on to Samar, who didn't have a whole lot to do this episode. I, I think her and Russ were kind of background characters this episode. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. They were just, uh, they were, uh, I was going to say Diego, with, with Donald, uh, just doing the stuff they need to do. Aram had a little bit more with uh, interacting with Liz over the files. Uh, mm. But yeah, I mean, they were just, uh, like you said, they, they were kind of front and center last week. And so this week we went back to the Red and Liz story. And it, it's what happens. You got a pretty big cast and you have to also make room for, of course, Nathan Lane being on the show. So, Yeah. And we got to talk to Mojan, who plays Samar. And let me tell you, to me, I was really surprised. Of, of all the actors, she's probably the least like her character that that I saw. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, I was actually kind of like, oh, you're you're, you're completely different than what I expected. So she was probably the most uh, you know, pleasant surprise, actually, meeting her in person. So it was really fun. And especially because Mojan is very well read and very well traveled and very cultured. So we wanted to know basically from her how much of her worldly adventures actually helped inform the character of Samar. I think it's helped a lot because she's, I think she, she's sort of written as somebody who's a polyglot and um, can easily blend into a lot of different um, ethnicities and places and, you know, um, and has had that kind of spy, extensive spy training. So I think it's useful. Pretty cool. I want to go back to when you introduced her, her question. Uh, if I've been to Wisconsin, is that cultured? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'm, Especially I'm if you grew checking. up there. <laughs> just checking. All right. Now, on to Aram. He gets a little bit, like you said, he gets a little bit more to do. He does use the auctions to identify who has the coin. That leads them to the Gabor Museum. And he has that sweet moment with Liz where she says, I'm here. I'm not back. I really like that line. But he, he's very excited to see her there and wants to spend time with her. It was just very like happy, I wouldn't say like a, a crush thing, but happy to see his friend again. He really, really missed his friend. I thought that was a very sweet moment between the two of them. It was great to have that scene specifically because if you know anything about Megan and Amir and their relationship, and they've kind of followed everything that each other of them does to kind of have that moment to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm here, but I'm not here, here. And it kind of have that bonding moment. I thought that was really a sweet scene for the two of them, to be quite honest, especially because we were able to see what that hallway looks like. And it is way smaller than what it actually is on TV. Yes, it was. Now I got I got to talk to them a, a little bit before I got I got pulled away. But you actually got to talk to both of them, and you got to interview them and ask them a couple questions. So what what did you land on? Yeah, I sure did. And, and let me tell you, when you get the two of these together, I mean, they are like the couple. <laughs> even when <they're>, even <laughs> they are chatty, chatty, chatty Cathy's. It was so much fun talking to them because it, it truly was Saram, literally in the flash right in front of you. And uh, we had to know basically what their thoughts were when they finally got the news that Saram was an official thing sealed with that kiss at the end of last season. I don't think we were like, yes! I was! No, just, <laughs> um, embarrassment. No, um, I think that's like, how long can they... It was like a three seasons, you know? It we, were like, we were like the ethnic Ross and Rachel. Absolutely. Yes, on NBC. <laughs> I think there's only so far you can tease it along until it becomes like annoying or frustrating. And I think they did it just the right amount of time. And now, and now we have like a new dynamic this season, which it's so funny. I like tension is like I, find, well, I should be careful what I say, but tension is like more interesting to play. So it's but it's like a new whole new given. I have like one line in the in the hundredth episode that is is pretty funny about the. the what about, what about but the, they're also not trying to? I'm sorry. I know they're not yeah. trying to like. I don't want to give anything away, but they're not trying to be yeah, like, don't. break no. them up and get them back together. They're like, no, this is the new given. Absolutely. Ram and Samar are like a work couple. And then, of course, being the 100th episode, remembering all the way back to season two, when they held hands in the hospital for the very first time, did either of them actually think the characters would end up at this spot by episode 100? No. I did. <laughs> he did, but that's because his mind goes like obsessing so over crazy. every detail. And everyone was like, no, no, no. She's like, she would like a red type. And her and red were flirting. And I was like, just wait. Just wait. You'll see. He wasn't that confident. Now he's overplaying the confidence. You'll see. He's overplaying the confidence. Give me a couple way. seasons. Mm-hmm. Anywho. Is this an interview? But it was a very good... <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually when we were working out that thumb grab... I remember that thumb grab in the hospital, our first war room scenes. I actually noticed that our brains, the way we work, was very, very similar. Different, but similar. And it was a very welcome addition. 
Okay, people, we were on to the final two. We're going to start with Red. He loves an adventure. I mean, loves it. That seems to be what drives him in, in many ways, which, you know, you, you can, or treasure hunt, I should say, not necessarily an adventure, treasure hunt. But my question, this is very important, is he on Ludes the entire episode? <laughs> because this is the giddiest, happiest I have seen Red probably the entirety of this show. Is it because he knew he was on episode 100? Yeah, this is like the direct opposite from the you know, Cape May, <laughs> where he's in the opium den. This is like, whoosh, you know, complete 180. He is on uppers like I've never seen before. I mean, he is just pepped up and ready to go. Treasure hunts apparently get this guy going. Do you do you think Red would have actually split the fortune if if Stern had played fair? Absolutely. I think Red is an honorable person when it comes to his business dealings. So for him, I mean, this was all about the penny. Wait, wait, wait. Doesn't every week, doesn't he screw over one of his business partners every week? Well, he's not screwing them over because they're inherently bad. I mean, he's, he's getting them arrested. He's turning they're them all in. bad. That's the whole point of the, that's the whole arrangement. You know, in this I, case. I get that. But your argument is he's very honorable in his business dealings and he's getting them arrested. I don't know if I would consider that honorable. Well, when, when it's a, when it's a thing where he has to come into the business equation, right? I mean, it's not like he like threw the, the shipping guy under the bus or the the artist guy under the bus. So, I mean, there's certain situations where, in this case, he actually needed something from Abraham. So, because he needed something from Abraham, I think he would have honored the 50-50 deal if it actually would have came down to that. Because at the end of the day, remember, it's all about the penny. It's not about the money. He's got nine, you know, nine figures. He doesn't need the cash. It's more of the excitement and the adventure of seeing if the cash actually was there. But for him, it's about, I need my damn penny back. Because without that penny, I can't get that awesome hat. Can't get that awesome hat. I keep forgetting about the hat, man. That was such a, a fun ad. Just weird, completely out of nowhere. And I'm like, I don't know if he could keep wearing that hat because it's one of those things where I think it works, but not on a weekly basis. I don't. I just don't think. I don't know if anybody could pull that off on a weekly basis. Even Churchill has struggled with that on a weekly basis. Heads were shaped differently back then, potentially. What? <laughs> yeah, we all change over time, you know. By the way, I like how you, when you're trying to confirm your opinion, even if I don't agree with it, you're like, right. As if that, you know what, when you say something, you're like, right, right, well, right. So, so many, so many children today are born, you know, obviously for C-sections. And so they have that nice round, perfect head because they don't do the normal procedure. Back then, it was probably more normal procedure because they didn't know how to do C-sections properly. So your head would be more pointed, which would make room for a, a taller hat. You're totally just making stuff up at this point. All right, so uh, we already talked about the language. Did He gave Stern, Stern a chance to redeem himself, and he chose to turn on him. Do you feel bad at all for Stern? I mean, this guy spent his entire life trying to find these pennies. Do you feel bad? Because I kind of felt like I get where he's coming from. I wouldn't want to share that either. I spent my whole life collecting these. Well, I mean, feel bad for him? No, because he got double-crossed because he double-crossed. So from that perspective, no, I don't. But at the same time, I think he was what's the word vindicated because the treasure mm-hmm. was there. So everything about his father and spending his life doing this stuff to see if the treasure actually was present. I think he, that was a victory for him. So I think that's, that's totally fine. And then the fact that it all got sucked up and taken away from him in the last minute, I think that's just all you get what gets coming to you because you lied, cheated and stealed your way to the treasure. Therefore we're going to lie, cheat and steal it away from you as well. Uh, when we get to the end, Liz hoodwinked him, and he seems to genuinely enjoy it. Like, he enjoys knowing she put one over on him. Am I wrong about that? It seemed to me like he really did enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like he almost was going to put on the hat and be like, good show, old chap. He was proud. He was I very think he proud. Was proud. Proud like a dad or proud just like a, proud like a criminal? I, I was just getting ready to say, I would not say proud like a dad because I don't want people throwing things at me. But it felt very fatherly to me. Like, if, if if she were my daughter, I would be very proud of that moment. <laughs> I was like, you got one over on me. Good for you. I'm doing that to people every week. You got me. Good job. Yeah, I'm surprised that he didn't even know that that was happening. That was very, very clever of Liz with that bloody handkerchief, bloody mm-hmm. towel. Uh, he does pull a penny from Liz's ear. Haha, <laughs> that was cute. And is going to buy a castle with the money, which I thought was pretty funny. But we do end up with Churchill's hat. One of the most noble heroes of our time. Do you think that means something? Or is it just a somebody he respects? I think it's somebody he respects because he's very you know art-driven, literature-driven. 
he, he's very, uh, what do you call it, cultured in that regard. So I think it's more that perspective of if Red is cultured, he would want to have this treasure, this uh, adventure, to know that Winston Churchill, who was this this phenomenal person, and the things that he was able to do in history, all because of this hat, right? I mean, the power of the hat. Like he becomes, well, maybe I can do those things too. I don't think there's a correlation with the the nobleman or honor perspective of Churchill's presence that's tied to that. I think it's truly just the quest. And because now he has the hat, he's like, I am just that much greater because I was able to accomplish this. All right. I didn't know if, I mean, obviously he idolizes Churchill and Churchill was a very stern, misunderstood, often frowned upon leader. People often did not respect him until he accomplished greatness. And I was wondering if possibly that is what he hoped for himself someday, that he will no longer be the misunderstood criminal. People will finally understand his potential for greatness. Because that was Churchill's one one big thing, overcoming that misunderstood perception. That's a really good point, actually. Every once in a while, I get one. Because, yeah, I mean, if he... If he was, and, and, and there's there's two kind of things happening here, right? There's that 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 angle you just mentioned, but then there's also the, you know, framed for a crime that he m- can't prove he committed or was even involved with, and maybe that's the whole thing that set up Red on this quest to begin with in the first place, is that something happened with the fire, 1990, all that stuff way back in the past. Maybe all of that is this kind of allegory to what Stern's father went through, and the fact that he's got to overcome that. So I think that's a very, very good observation that he's trying to say, look, I am the great man that I thought I could be, regardless of what other people say. It's interesting. I'd like to know what listeners think. What the, you know, you're going to mention if you like the hat, if you want to throw in, what do you think the significance of that hat is? That would be cool. I would kind of be curious what you guys think. Yeah. But now we've got to the point where I know many of you are excited about. You've always wondered, when are you going to have Jane Spader on the show? Well, he is here. We have Jane Spader. We talked to him for a few minutes, and the first question I posed to Jane Spader was, Spader first hit our cinematic consciousness in the 80s, right? Almost stereotyped as a villain. And then he finally broke out with an eclectic body of work that would make most working actors really envious. That's why I asked him, why was it he would want to return to villainy with The Blacklist? You know, I this is also a television show, mm-hmm. and... And the things that you're talking about was when I was working in film and, and therefore going and playing a villain for a couple of months or a few months or then going in the same year going and playing a, the protagonist in a film, um, there's the opportunity for that. But a television show is something that you have to live with, as you see, for 100 episodes. <laughs> you know, So, you know, when you're living with a character that long, I just would not be interested in... I was very lucky in the first television character that I ended up playing was sort of the same. He was somebody who was a very quirky and idiosyncratic character who seemed to sort of dance on the edge of lightness and darkness, you know. And I got spoiled, you know. He was somebody who it was a character on a show I did called Boston Legal, and he was a character who was by turns very dramatic and emotional and at other times very irreverent and sort of and just sort of silly and um, and so when I was looking for another television show to do I was quite by design looking for a character where um, it was not going to be it was going to have a fluidity and tone for that character and that his personality was going to be such that um I'd be able to play with a lot of different things. And that's what I ended up with. In comparison, between the 100th episode of Boston Legal versus the 100th episode of The Blacklist, what is similar and what is different between those experiences? I think if there was anything that was consistent between the two, is I really think that both shows were um, very hard to pigeonhole. You know, I, I don't, and I don't think that. I really knew what they were. I don't know whether I thought they were... Uh, at turns, they were more funny, and, and then it turns more serious. And, and 
uh, that one was much more overt and silly than this, but still, there are episodes we do of this that are very much that way. And then we also do episodes in this that are just sort of scary or much more intense and, and so on, but still, it's married with this, this tendency towards emotion and, and intimacy and, and so on. Um, and I think that I remember when I, the first season, I was at the Golden Globes, and I had met when I'd finished doing Boston Legal. I, you know, continued doing some film work and so on. But I was still looking for another series to do, and I met with the heads of most of the cable networks um, to see if they had anything that was of interest to do. And I had met one of them was the guys who were at AMC. And uh, I didn't find anything really anywhere just at the time. It was a matter of timing. I just didn't find anything at that point. And then this crossed my threshold. And I read this and was very excited about doing it. And then we did it. And then I'm out of the Golden Globes in December. So the show had aired for that autumn. Right. And I'm walking in and the guys at AMC are all standing in front of out in front there and they pulled me over and they said how the hell did Bob Greenblatt get this show on Broadcast Network <laughs> it's like what the hell is it doing on a Broadcast Network and I said yeah I, I agree <laughs> you know uh, but we got it you know <laughs> uh, and so I think you know this show is you know I think it somewhat unique and you know people I think people like something that feels like it's that it has its own individuality you know? right. and I think the, you know this character is that he's he's a strange guy you know? he's, he's, he embraces his own individuality I think how because you you love to play a lot of different roles is there, is there anyone from the blacklist in terms of maybe blacklisters or other roles that you've, you've come across as you did the script and went, wow, that would be something I would love to chew on? Quite a few. Yeah? Anybody yeah. stick out? Or? Well, no, I love our, our, some of the, guy, the Red's cohorts. You know, I love Teddy, who, who's here, uh, and, uh, and Clark, who plays Glenn, and uh, Susan, great role, Mr. Mr. Kaplan. Uh, all of those roles. I love all of Red's people, and and then some of our blacklisters. I have I've liked through the years, uh, but I think probably this. I I probably for me the softest place in my heart on, on, in terms of cast members on our show are are probably some of those people in Red's world. You know, I've spent the last five years spending a, a lot of time with them, and and they're all very. Interesting and unique and and eccentric characters, and I love and I love that in life. I, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I I love it in work as well. Keeps it exciting. Yeah. Yeah, James was fascinating to talk to. I mean, very in the moment. It's just really great to see him kind of reflect, especially as he's thinking about his conversation and what he's going to respond with. Very thoughtful in what he actually is going to deliver, and I thought that was very interesting about him as a as a person to just think about if I'm going to speak, what is it that I actually want to convey in this moment? Because every moment seemed to him to be precious. So I thought that was really cool just to have that moment to be able to talk to him. Mostly what I was thinking was, I hope I didn't ask anything too stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's honestly what I was thinking. Because for me, I, I have such a, a vast knowledge of his work I had so many things I could ask him that had nothing to do with the blacklist, which obviously we're there for the blacklist. So you got to ask him blacklist questions and I get that. So I was trying to phrase a question that was relatable both to his past um, filmography and also to the present. And I, I hope that that worked, but it was really interesting to actually meet him because he is very kind and pleasant and soft spoken. He's not gregarious or, or, loud. It seems very, very thoughtful. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, this is like an inside thing, I guess, but we were actually talking to um, other actors at the time that he became available. 
And he refused to talk to us until we were finished with them. And I thought that was just very nice because I have interviewed a lot of actors with um, my other podcast and I haven't met many that are not that considerate. So I thought that was a very kind and thoughtful gesture and not enough of that stuff gets mentioned about other actors. So when they're, when they're good thing, too many, too many negative things floating around in the Hollywood circles right now. I think that's a pretty positive thing to say. He, he seems like a very thoughtful man. Yeah. Funnier story as we're standing in this holding area, which goes out into the the place where you come into the, the building. Uh, James actually came in while we were in holding and he came in in like full Reddington costume that literally when I saw him, I actually took a step back because I thought it was Reddington at first. And then I had to like change. <laughs> I changed my brain to go, oh, wait, no, that's James Spader. <laughs> but I did. I literally took a step back. I was like, holy crap. It's like red right there. What, you think he's going to put a hit on you? Well, I didn't expect him to come in in like a full, the full costume, right? Figured like, you know, you know, nice swagger, maybe, nice, nice sport coat, maybe a hat kind of thing, but not the full like trench coat, glasses, the whole thing. I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was ready to go. He was ready to take a hit on Troy. I mean, I was, I had money there. I had cash on hand, but <laughs> people were placing bets. Turns out he's just an actor. Who and, knew? And a really nice guy. Really nice. Very, very nice guy. Speaking of nice people, we also got to spend some time with Megan Boone, whose character Liz is apparently the damn stew maker. I did not see that coming. She's basically Lady Red, and she's a stew maker now. Did, were you at all shocked by this development? Because I want to point out, my friend, last week on this very podcast, you said she hasn't really broken the law. She's, she's killed people by self-defense. This is so over breaking the law. It's, it's, it's broke. It's done broken. You can't say that she's not a criminal now. If you go back to the tape, I did say she's not Dark Liz yet. Yet. I emphasize the yet part. So did you already go back and listen to it because you knew that you were wrong now? You're like, ah, crap. Well, she, wasn't, she wasn't super dark up until then, but this this is freaking dark, man, because it's not only that, the, that <laughs> you actually go back and do the whole stew maker thing, literally do the shower thing, literally do the plastic Dexter tape up the room thing, but the fact that you put him in a heart-shaped bathtub. I mean, I mean... It, it, there's like some irony there. Like, I really love doing this. I think this is fun. <laughs> a heart yeah, shaped bathtub. I want to know. She was enjoying it a little too much. I thought whoever got the location for that place. Like, kudos. Kudos to location group, a heart shaped bathtub. That was so fun. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never sit in one again. I don't, I don't care. No. My wife begs me. Nope. 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 I'm nope. good. Sippers, I don't know what's drain anymore. Whatever. Man. Nope. 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 Not going there ever again. Mm. And Detective Singleton's on the trail because Liz was awesome about covering a murder up, except in the garbage disposal. <laughs> Come on! Why would you put that in the garbage disposal? You know the rules. That's a f They're going to check everywhere. Why wouldn't you put it in your pocket or stick it in your wound or something? Yeah, take it with you into the closet. I you mean took a body in a bag. Put the, put the towel in the bag. Get it out of there. I mean, I, I realize that she was trying to get rid of evidence, but... I never in a million years would I put think that putting in a garbage disposal is going to get rid of it because they will check. They, they will. will check. They will. Rookie mistake, Liz. Rookie mistake. Uh, but she's definitely dark. She also robs a police impound, which is pretty law breaky. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. The best part um, about that is that she used technology that and a concept that she learned from her husband. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Which one? Explain. Well, the fact that Tom taught her how to use the packet sniffer. In order to to go use the cell phone in order to get it in there, so they get the code to get into the evidence vault. That's right. I forgot that. Good catch. Yeah. Good catch. Nice little nice little throwback there. I'm sure there was a lot of throwbacks we didn't even catch all of. I'm sure we're just having so much fun with this episode. It was a lot of fun. I, I watched it twice, and I had a, a I think I had more fun the second time because <laughs> I wasn't kind of taken aback for the the tone of the episode because I guess I had expectations going in, like I'm sure some of you did. That it was going to be mythology. It was going to be a lot of. Th it was going to be a lot of things that it wasn't. And the second time, I had so much. I had a fun time the first time. I had more fun the second time because I knew what it was at that point. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I'm still kind of stunned that she got rid of that body, but she did find a glass eye. Yeah, because she if she followed the eye. procedure, then nothing should have been left behind. So why glass eye sticking around? That's interesting. Well, no, acid doesn't. There's certain. It doesn't dis, uh, disintegrate plastic. I don't believe. Correct. That's why you can put it in those big giant – that's what Breaking Bad taught me. You can put it in those big plastic barrels and it won't – the acid won't eat through it. So if if it is a plastic – well, this is glass. Glass – will glass disintegrate? Well, it's probably a, it's a plastic covering to protect it or something. 
Yeah, something. But I, I like that. I thought that was kind of a cool touch that Happy had a glass eye. Navarro had a glass eye. Yeah. The actor was named Happy. I'm sorry. And then uh, the uh, next-gen technology inside of it, is that something they could track? Is it a camera? Is somebody watching them? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, really interesting to see where that uh, new technology is going to take the episode for when uh, Blacklist comes back. Could what the hell do you think it is? What do you think it is? I'm assuming it's got to be some kind of transmitter, like a Google Google Glass type thing, where it can record information that they're seeing. So my guess is they're going to use a ROM in the next episode, and they're going to have him basically take out whatever microchip or something that's in there, and it'll actually have recording and play it back to find out who the Damascus Knife person is, which we all know is Eva Glenn. <laughs> you should, that's the one thing we you should have asked Clark Middleton. What do you think about having an evil, um, evil twin brother? <laughs> <laughs> Missed good, opportunity, my opportunity, friend. My friend, my fault. Missed opportunity. Okay, now we also talked to Megan Boone, who plays Liz. And I, I, one more time, I want to say she was just a, a wonderful person. We actually saw her a couple times throughout our time there, and she was great to us. Uh, just, just one of the most genuine, sweet people I've met in person a- across the entertainment industry. So. I can't say enough nice things about her. Yeah, I mean, when you break onto the scene and catapult into the public life, it, it can have its ups and downs. Uh, but after 100 episodes, Megan has always risen to the challenge to take her craft and her personal life to the next level. And if you think her smile is infectious on the screen, it is even more so in real life. It was an absolute pleasure to have Megan here on the podcast back in season four. But I think even more so to have met her in person. Here's what she had to say regarding the 100th episode of The Blacklist. You guys! Welcome to the podcast. Yes, How are you? Welcome to the set. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, Megan. How are you? I'm glad you're here. Absolutely. It's good to have real, real fans here. So, Not just people who have, like, you know, be been here. assigned to watch the show. <laughs> what is this like for you? Is this, I mean, for any actor Overwhelming, to be, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, this event itself is overwhelming, but... Um, Reflecting on having done a hundred episodes is it's it's kind of hard to process actually. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. We I came into this one person and I'm leaving another, and to be part of a crew and cast of people that accomplish this in this day and age when like mm-hmm. this never happens anymore is extraordinary. I'm just so thankful to you guys and the fans and the the people who made the podcasts and made the. Um, Tumblr pages and the Twitter accounts and, oh, yeah. you know, who propagated and promulgated, like, the fandom of the show. That's really what gave it its legs. So, it's great. One thing that's really interesting is that you're taking the time, based on your 100 episodes, to understand how the industry works. I want to hear a little bit about your sustainability program and that you're trying to do and bring into the world of film and TV, because we do leave a lot of waste behind. So, I'm just interested yeah. in your thoughts there. Well, I really hope to be able to create solutions for the fact that right now I see us making film and TV uh, and telling stories that hurt human life because it's a detriment to the ecosystem that supports human life. And I hope to work together with the corporate entities whom I've developed close relationships with and the knowledge that I've developed in being on a show for this long and try to find a way to create film and TV and tell stories that's for human life and for uh, the ecosystem that supports that life. So um, I'm just interested in cracking the code. Like, what is it we can do in the public and private sector to work together to make a sustainable model for film and TV production? I I kind of want to know, like, it's 100 episodes, five years. Do you have one takeaway moment where you think about it, where just this always comes in your mind when you think about it? You know, you're in the you're, you're here in the room, in the place where it happens. I mean, this is the war room, and we usually shoot here on Fridays. Um, and this is where I'm with the heart and soul of the show, and you know, the cast. Uh, so. I'll never forget those times. I'll never forget stabbing James Spader in the neck with a pen the first within the first five minutes of meeting him. Um, I'll never forget um, 
trying to resuscitate Isabella Rossellini from the floor of the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Um, I'll never forget when they told me Nathan Lane was going to be our hundredth blacklister, and um, the fact that when I was nine years old, and my grandparents, who have both passed away in the course of the show, took me to my first play, and it was the lights came up, and there was Nathan Lane's face, and funny thing happened on the way to the forum, and it just feels like serendipity and I'll never forget getting that call that you know I was going to be Elizabeth Keene and it's um, you are Elizabeth Keene you're not going to be anymore well not anymore <laughs> but yeah this has been well, well I can take a minute no I'm here. okay I don't want to <laughs> Do you, uh, I do this every day. I know. <laughs> <laughs> how, how has it been? Because you have endured fandom, both positive and negative, over the course of the character. What's it been like as an actor? Because I'm sure it's, you get to a point where you're like, I don't want to look at the internet anymore, and then there's other times where I really want to see what the internet says. Well, I've gone through the... You know, a course of emotions. You know, my first response was to take it very personally. And then... Our country and our world changed so dramatically since since I first came on the show, and I started to realize that the scrutiny that befalls women in the media is much it's much more intense than with uh, if I were to be a young man who I mean it, it was it was the way that I sort of catapulted into pop culture from nowhere that was really what made the response to me so so dramatic at the time and it's really leveled out quite a quite a bit i very rarely get uh see a negative thing in my in my notifications it was just um the natural tendency for i think the internet to be very critical of you know of yeah so now you know i'm glad that i i'm glad that i've developed the coping mechanisms that were necessary at that time to, to deal with being a public figure. But I think that that's probably something that everyone who moves into the space of being a public figure for the first time without expecting it, really. Uh, that's an experience that, that you have to go through. It's sort of like a... It's, it's like a rite of passage. You know? And it better equips you for life after this. Yeah, I feel ready to whatever for whatever <laughs> whatever is to come um, how about you guys are you looking forward to the to the rest of the season have you enjoyed season 5 oh season 5 has been great I think it's been great because it's been the comedic lift that we needed after season 4 it's been, yeah. a, lot of it's been a lot of fun especially seeing you because like the smile is just infectious no thank so it you it just lights up the screen and we're like she's having fun this is great yeah. first few episodes and then it yeah, all it, could, it, it all gets crashing crashing yeah, I know yeah. Nice to see you, Megan. Absolutely. Man, this was a super fun time being able to be on the set for this great milestone to meet everybody, share all of these interviews with all of you because it's with all your support, watching every single week, telling your friends to check out this show on Netflix here in the States or whatever other service in the country uh, that you're currently listening or watching the show in. I mean, all of you make 100 episodes possible and make that happen. So just thank you so much for you know watching the show, listening to our podcast, just interacting on in all the places. I mean, this is how we get episode 200. We keep the family together and so we can uh, get more blacklisters. Yeah, and I'm going to I'll I'll have a little personal moment here for a second. So I uh just recently lost a friend of mine. And and just uh, I'm not trying to bring this show down. It, it's going to a happy place. So I, I just lost a, a, a close friend of mine, Justin McCumber. Now, TV Talk started many, many years ago, and Justin McCumber and I, he was my co-host on my other podcast, and we decided to go off and we're going to do this thing called TV Talk, and we, we went to do that. And that's where I met Troy. So had I not – so this whole – is just like coming back to me because of this 100th episode, and it's kind of like a celebration, and we've been doing this for so long, and you know, there's a lot we're proud of. But – you know, it kind of brought it home to me of the special moments and memories that I have because of this podcast. I met a lot of wonderful people. 
I, I have met, I mean, yeah, it's great to just, you know, to be able to, to name drop and say, you know, like Spader and, and those names, but the fans, the, the people that really love the show, the other podcasting hosts we met because of this, um, the events that we've gone to because of our love of the show coinciding with your love of the show. And then to, to have that all come together to lead to this really special event that Troy and I got to share together because we've become very close friends in New York with, with the cast and crew and also with fans. We did some stuff with fans when we were out there too. It just, this episode really kind of brought everything home to me and, and what this journey has been. And it has really, really touched my heart and soul as a, as a podcaster, as a person to both see the show succeed, continue to succeed, see the podcast succeed and continue to succeed and see the listeners kind of, kind of grow together and become friends and us podcasters grow and become friends and kind of just e evolve the evolution of all of this and, and where it all started to where it is now and all the memories that it has brought with this hundredth episode kind of brought it all into focus for me. And, and I really want to say thank you to everybody, Troy specifically and everybody listening uh, and of course, Sony and the blacklist and everything else, but just thank you to everybody. It, it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride. And this hundredth episode kind of really brought it all home for me personally. Yeah. We've done many TV fan podcasts in the past. And I think the biggest learning that I got from all of that was that it was kind of our, our warm up we, to understand like, what does it mean to really cover a TV show? What does it mean to interact with the, the cast and the crew? What does it mean to interact with fans on a regular basis? And, I think that was all just really great work that we've done over the years, and especially leading us to TV talk and especially to get this show. I mean, this was, you know, we, we got the blacklist handed to us on a silver platter when I joined the TV talk network. And, and I can't thank Stuart Crane enough for that opportunity because it led to all of this and it led to meeting Aaron and, and then to find out that Aaron lives in the area so we can hang out even outside of the podcast stuff. I mean, it's just, it's been a real blessing. So, I mean, we might, we might sound like we're an old married couple and, and bicker <laughs> and all that other fun stuff and calls me dumb, dumb and robot and all that other stuff. But it, no, that's all true though. It's, so that's, it, that's genuine. It is genuine. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, nobody better than to have do that with me for over, over for us now too, right? We're, we're over a hundred episodes of doing this, uh, for the blacklist. So it just, yeah, it's been a great <laughs> that's time. Smart, that's how smart I am. I didn't even realize it was our hundredth episode of like two, two back, right? Two back. Yeah. Like two back. Thur. So, but I, I, I think the best thing about this is just the fan community. I mean, I know that we've all had, you know, those run-ins, right? I mean, there's been the, the daddy gators and the Lisington shippers and the keen tours and the, and the keenlers. And it, it, sometimes it feels like we're all just really angry with each other on a lot of points, but at the same time, we're all part of this amazing show. I mean, when, when this show ends at some point, hopefully not for a very long time, but when this show ends, we can all look back and say, look at all of these people that we were able to meet that we never would have had any interaction with because of the blacklist. So, I mean, just if you take nothing else away, next time you have one of those conversations, just take a moment and just say, you know what? I'm really grateful and appreciative that, you're a fan and I'm a fan and we can share in this moment together. Yeah. Be passionate together. Absolutely. We're going to be right back with Red's rhetoric right after this. Welcome to Smirk. Each week, one of our hosts will write a story with a specific topic in mind. After unraveling their tale, the fun begins as we identify and launch into a spirited discussion on the author's topic. It's a meshing of creative storytelling, realistic discussion, and a healthy dose of humor. Be sure to subscribe to Smirk on your favorite podcast app. And visit our website at smirkpodcast.com. This is the show that looks at truth, fiction, and reality with a smirk. Hi, it's Megan Boone, and you're listening to Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Welcome to Red's Rhetoric, that part of the show where we play two scenes from this week's episode of The Blacklist, and then you get to vote, which is your favorite over at theblacklistexposed.com. Just look for the case profile for Abraham Stern. Well, 70% of you think that sternums should be tattooed because Red Tattoo won last week. Our first clip this week comes when Red gets all flustered about technology. Anything yet? No. Remind me again what it is that we think we're doing here. The phone acts as a passive packet sniffer. It's a trick Tom taught me. Packet sniffer? Ugh. 
The FBI uses them. I'm sure your tech people know all about them. It can intercept and log traffic that passes over a digital network. It is an absolute mystery to me how these gadgets work. The Dick Tracy phones, these blue teeth connections. Quite frankly, I miss the rotary phone. Except that zero, watching that zero crawl back. Oh my God, it was painful. Our second comes when Red and Abraham talk about Abraham's father. A lowly maintenance worker. And yet what he did is legendary. What he allegedly did. Sometimes I wonder if that's all there is. A legend. If the pennies hold the secret to your inheritance, why didn't your father give them to you? He did, in his will. But at the time, I was a snot-nosed 16-year-old, and to me, he was a failure, who'd been accused of a crime he had nothing to show for. So I spent them on candy. Four fireballs. Whoops. The next month, his executor gave me a letter my father had left for me. That's when I learned that the pennies were the key to a great treasure. And you've spent the past 40 years looking for it. I've lied, I've cheated. I've killed in pursuit of it. I believe my father was a criminal, and I assume he left me the pennies so I wouldn't become one. And yet here you are. The apple never falls very far. Does it? Which was your favorite? If you never want to see the zero crawl back on that rotary phone ever again, vote hashtag red tech. I keep laughing every time I think about that. (laughs) Or if you think the child becomes the sins of the father, vote hashtag red apple. Okay, guys, that is going to do it for this episode of the Blacklist Exposed. I had a freaking great time. I know it was a lot longer because we had the interviews, but I am sure you loved everyone. You probably skipped right past us to get to the interviews, and I totally understand that. And I want to thank the entire cast, crew, and Sony and NBC for helping us put this together so we could bring this to the fans because I know every one of you is going to love it. Yeah, thanks so much to everybody for watching, for listening, uh, to Stuart Crane, again, for giving me the opportunity to do the Blacklist, to the Podcast Academy. We won an award for this thing. I mean, that's that's freaking amazing. I can't still can't believe that happened, but it wouldn't have happened without the great people like John Bokenkamp and John Eisendrath running the show, steering this place where it needs to go. The amazing writers in the writer's room, uh, just you know, shout out to our friends, right? Metzger, Taylor Martin, Noah Schechter. Uh, Marissa Tam and the rest of the crew that I am totally missing and all the people that have come before them like Daniel Knopf, Luke Ryder, uh, Orsi. I mean, just a, a really great group of people out there. And then, of course, everybody that makes this happen on a regular basis out there in New York, right? Uh, the stunt coordinators, all the consultants, the camera people, the directors. Um, and Pepe! And of course, Pepe! Anthony Pepe! <laughs> uh, just a really great time out there. And uh, special thanks again to Amir uh, for having given us a great tour uh, of the set. <laughs> yeah, Amir gave us a tour. And he also Oh, that's right. You could tell we can tell people this now. He he actually let us uh do an interrogation scene basically with him. I think there's a photo of it, right? Yeah. Isn't that gonna be our, our picture for this episode? Yeah, there'll, I think? Be, there'll be a photo uh up on the um the post, the right? The post, yeah, the the case profile. I, we've been calling it the same thing for like a hundred episodes now. <laughs> <laughs> Way to keep up, man. Yeah, yeah. so I that was that was really fun that he he was willing to do that. So thanks to him. Yeah, and then a, a special uh, tour we got from Megan Boone. So thank you so much for that, Megan. And just uh, super excited you guys could all be here for the 100th episode celebration. And now on to the next hundred. Yes, we'll be back with uh, special agent intel for next week for all of you. But if you have stuff you want to talk about regarding Abraham Stern, definitely conversations going in the Facebook group. Just search for The Blacklist Exposed and you can join in there or hit us up on Twitter at The Blacklist GSM is our handle. We'll be tweeting along, of course, on the East Coast feed. And most importantly, if you just want to go ahead and send in your thoughts uh, via email, you, you can do that. That old technology like the rotary phone, uh, just send it on in to feedback at goldenspiralmedia.com. And we'd love to hear from you and your thoughts on what you've learned, gained, garnered, uh, experienced over the last 100 episodes of The Blacklist. 
All right. That's going to conclude this episode. Thanks so much, guys, for being here. Thanks for uh, being supportive of our show. You can also subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast player of choice. You can even listen from the website. But if you're really on the go, make sure you download our app for iOS and Android, powered by Spreaker. You will also find all the intel and analysis about this episode for Abraham Stern by visiting theblacklistexposed.com. Big thanks for listening all of these episodes, the entire journey that you've taken with us. Thank you so much for listening. But don't forget to answer our profiling question. What do you think of Red's new hat? <laughs> it's marvelous. God. Uh, and what do you think it means, by the way? Add to that. What Add do you think that. it means? Definitely. All right. All we right. will see you next time. We'll see you for 101. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie, right? We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5 Popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.